I will deal with some topics today like amorphous materials, which are non-crystalline. We were talking about crystal structure and defects, and so we'll talk a little bit about amorphous materials. I would also like to deal a little bit with um, some processing. So single crystalline materials, how a typical example, say silicon, how it is processed. And an amorphous material, for example, glass, how is it processed? I'll deal with that a little bit. And then uh, to lay one more foundational step that I realize we will need coming down when we come to electrical properties, I want to talk about phase diagrams. Again, there may be some familiarity. You've studied it probably. But I'll review that to lay some foundation for our, our course, the electronics uh, part of it, how we apply the phase diagrams in, in our uh, crystal growth, for example, or crystal purification. I'll take up an example. So that's roughly what I will do in this lecture. And if time permits, we'll go on to some other topics. Let me begin with non-crystalline materials. The definition or the classification of materials typically goes like this. We have amorphous materials which have short range order but no long range order. Okay. In other words, if you look at the atoms, the way they are bonded in their immediate vicinity, they look very similar to crystals. A silicon will be bonded to four other silicons and so on. The difference between the amorphous materials and the crystalline materials comes when we start looking at the long range order. How is this repeat unit? In the case of crystals, we have the unit cell. If I know the unit cell, I know everything about that structure. That wouldn't be the case for an amorphous material because in that case, uh, the structure goes on changing over the range. The immediate close structure, short range, is um, the same, but the way they are arranged within the network goes on changing. And then we will have polycrystalline materials. And then we will have single crystalline materials. And uh, when we come, we see that in this classification, there is increasing order. Okay. So when we go from amorphous materials to single crystalline materials to polycrystalline materials, there is increasing order in the system. And then we have a sort of a subcategory that I will write because it is very important today are the nanocrystalline materials. Almost no lecture is complete without the word nano these days, so at least we should be aware of that word and its implications for the future. <clears throat> so I, I hope you understand the difference between the polycrystalline and single crystalline material. When we were talking about grain boundaries, I pointed out that uh, single crystalline material all through has the uniform structure in polycrystalline material there are boundaries that come between regions of the same structure. Now to just briefly touch upon what is this nanocrystalline material, you can think in terms of a uh, surface to volume ratio for a material. And if you take, say, something that is a sphere with radius r, the surface area is given by 4 pi r squared. And the volume is given by 4 by 3 pi r cube. You're familiar with this, right? So if I were to take now the surface to volume ratio, I will get something like 3 by r, right? So what does this tell me? As I go from uh, a large sphere to a smaller and smaller sphere, that means the radius is going on, decreasing. What is happening to the surface to volume ratio? It increases. So eventually we come to a point where the surface may be larger than the volume. In other words, there may be more surface atoms for that particle than there are bulk atoms inside the volume of it. So let's say there is, just typically to say, there may be one atom in the volume inside there, but there are so many atoms on the surface, it's reduced to a size of that scale. Now, the surface properties, as we saw, are very different because the surface behaves in a different way from the bulk. So you can imagine that if this material uh, were a large particle, probably its properties would be dominated by the bulk properties. 
On the other hand, as we make it smaller and smaller, either by breaking up the big material into smaller chunks, attrition or breakdown, we will get to a point where now the atoms on the surface predominate compared with the atoms within the bulk. And so my properties are going to look rather different in this case. All right? Um, another related topic will be where we can confine semiconductor layers to what are called quantum structures. We'll take this up later. It's a very important uh, topic. In other words, if I can go on shrinking the dimensions of layers that I'm growing, I have a substrate, and I'm going to grow a layer of something on it. Okay? And if I can make this dimension very small, of the order of some nanometers, okay, we are talking very, very small dimensions, I can grow it in a controlled fashion, single crystalline, then we produce what are called, of course, there may be other layers over it and a series of them. But when this layer thickness is very small, then we produce quantum wells. So we have confined it to two dimensions. Remember, this is a surface that we are looking at in cross-section. So it's, it's confined in two, two dimensions. Uh, I'm sorry, it's confined in one dimension, the thickness, and the other dimension is extending out in space. I can confine it into two dimensions in some ways. So I will have two-dimensional confinement producing wires, quantum wires. So now the only dimension that is uh, long is this length here. Everything else has been confined down to quantum dimensions, nano dimensions. I, I'll explain why I use the term quantum in a second. And then the latest is quantum dots. Where we've gone and taken the material and confined it on all three dimensions to create quantum dots. And very interesting, all these processing techniques that allow us to do this. Uh, we use techniques like MOCVD, Metal Organic Chemical Vapor Deposition, MBE, and so on, that some of you may have heard about at least. And we will touch upon this in more detail. Why did I keep on writing the word quantum? We are not yet dealing with it in great detail. But as the size goes on decreasing, the properties, the electronic properties of, say, the quantum well of that material are drastically altered. Okay? So now we begin to see phenomena like quantum tunneling. All right? That means if an electron wants to go from one part to another part, if there is a barrier in between, and the electron is here, it wants to go here, either it has to go across the barrier, which is a thermally activated process, right? Or if this barrier is thin enough, it is able to tunnel through. And that's where we talk of the dimensions coming down to nanometers and angstrom scale. And these phenomena of tunneling uh, are not explained by other means other than by quantum mechanics, that we can understand it. But it gives rise to very, very new properties, which we will deal with in when we come to the semiconductors and how when, they con when we create these quantum wells and so on, how the properties change. I'll take that up when we come. But just to give you an idea that when we talk of nano, we could be talking of particles like this. And because of the larger surface, the surface properties dominate. Or we may be talking of something of this kind, where we're talking of quantum wells, quantum wires, and quantum dots. Can you give me an example of an amorphous material? Glass. Glass, all right. That's the most common thing we encounter. Window panes, the glasses we drink from, and so on, because there is no structure to it. And what is the formula, if you would put, for glass? That's more or less a trick question because there's no fixed formula, all right? It's, um, the, the base is SiO2. It's this, this structure is quads, right? Or vitreous silica. In the amorphous form, it is known as vitreous silica. In the crystalline form, it's quads, and which has uh, different uh, forms, you know, crystobolite, tridomite, and so on. But... Uh, if I take this basic structure and I modify it with things like sodium, I get soda glass, right? Sodium silicate. If I put in lead, for example, 
what would happen? Why would I want to put in lead anyway into glass? Increase the ductility or 